Hello, everyone. Um, so first of all, um, just to clarify, I'm far from being the expert. Um, what I'm going to show you today is something that I learned for the past seven months when I was working at uh, the company I'm working right now. Um, uh, so yeah, so not really an expert, but the things I've learned were cool and fun, and I just want to share with you guys. Uh, just a notion here, I know it's the second day, and we are half of the day, and you guys are probably exhausted. However, this, this talk is very code-intensive. Code so please don't fall back into Twitter, you know, timeline, whatever, because you might get lost and then you're going to be bored. Um, I have some introduction here, which I'm going to skip because this introduction is something you guys uh, should be pretty much familiar with. Basically, the idea that software engineering should be a little bit more concerned about the fundamental fu foundations, things like mathematics and function programming actually does it. And yeah, that's why we, we're happy to be here on this conference. However, there is, a, there is a problem with functional programming. There are, there, are some, there are some core problems that, even though we have, we've been having functional programming for decades now, are still not yet fixed. And one of those is recursion. I mean, if you are using strongly type-dependent languages, then recursion is also kind of all the problems with recursions are fixed for you. But uh, just to, out of curiosity, how many of you guys actually use every other day Iris or Agda or Code? Yeah, lucky two guys, you know, lucky you. But us, little ones, we have to use other languages, and, and we have problems with recursions, which you guys probably don't have. Um, so, and recursion schemes, the topic that I'm going to talk about, basically what you're going to guys see is kind of a way to tackle the problems that we normally see with recursion, that we can do it in a reasonable way. And out of those recursion schemes, which are kind of, kind of composal combinators, um, emerge patterns which are just tremendous. And I'm hopefully, hopefully in the 45 minutes that I have, we'll be able to show you guys that. However, to actually show the cool stuff, I need to first introduce you guys to the fundamentals. So just please, you know, put your seat belts and just bear with me. Um, uh, if you guys are interested in actually uh, using recursion schemes, there are libraries written in Haskell. I'm working in a code base in Scala. The code base is open source, and because there was no uh, Scala implementation of recursion schemes, uh, one, one of my colleagues pretty much just, just poured the recursion schemes implementation in Haskell into, into Scala implementation, which is called Matroska. And both, both of those projects are, are open source, so if you'll be interested in more details, there, there are the links. Also, all right, so first thing, recursive structures. If we want to talk about recursion and recursion structures, Let's think of an example first. So, so recursive structure is going to be things like data structures, like lists. Lists by nature are recursive, or maybe binary tree. But those are like basic data structures that you you'd normally find in computer science. But there are things that you would find recursive uh, in a way that you use normally, like your, your bank report is a report which is based on reports, which are based on reports, also, and so on and so on. Uh, basically, any structure that is inductive, inductively defined, is your recursive data structure. Now, the example that we're going to use here, I try to think of an example that would be simple enough to comprehend within seconds so we can focus on the cool stuff and not really focus on the example. So I've, I've chosen something very trivial, which are expressions. And so here is an expression, uh, you know, this one that you have to see over here, and we can represent it in our code base in a way like this. So basically, we have a sum of 10 that is squared and multiplication of 20 half and 14 and a half. And yeah, so that's basically our representation of our expression. Does it make sense, this representation? Yes, no? Yeah, all right, awesome. Or we could think of this representation, all right, and if you want to square that, we can just you know, add another layer. And we can think of this expression basically as a, as a kind of structure like tree, right? Where, where our square here is our root, and the other expressions are nested. So now, when we have a recursive uh, structure like this one, we, uh, so we can actually represent it. And this is the representation that we have in Haskell. And the cool thing about Haskell is that it's, it's, you can really read what we just seen here. You can read this in code base. However, I said this example is going to be in Scala, so we will have to deal with this. And, and there's a cool trick that you have to do if you have a boilerplate is basically color your code base. So I have a convention here that if anything is in gray, just, just treat it as a bullet plate. The, the cool thing is in, in color, right? And that's, 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 you, that's how you're going to read uh, Scala code here. So 
So when I say the, uh, the problem with, with recursive calls, so let's, let's say we want to write a function evaluate, which will basically evalu evaluate our expression. Uh, if we look at, if we think about this um, body as this method is just straightforward, for every uh, case in our ADT, we provide uh, a value. If it's a leaf, and I'm saying a leaf, basically a value, either an integer or, or decimal value, we just return that value. If it's something else, like for example, summing two things together, well, before we actually sum those things together, we that first explicitly have to call recursively our function to those two expressions, xp1 and xp2, right? Uh, so we're kind of doing our, we're doing two things here. We're doing our business logic, which is evaluating the expression, but also our code base is responsible for pushing the recursion forwards down to the recursive structure until, until it reaches the leaves, and then it can traverse back to give us the final result. That might not look like a bad idea. I mean, it's a little bit of noise, but we can survive, right? The problem is that if you look at your other implementations, so for example, make string, which takes an expression and gives you a string, it kind of looks similar. Right? For leaves, it has to give you a value of, of, of those leaves. If, if it's actually doing something, it, it, before it actually will do it, in this example, before it will give you a string, it has to first pass the call to uh, a recursive call to our function. So the, the, we see that there's a, there's a pattern that emerges here. However, that's still not an issue. The issue might be something like a function optimize. So let's say we want to have a function optimize that takes an expression and gives us an expression as a result. The difference is, is that if we see a multiplication where we multiply two things which are equal, we will just say it's a square of one of those things. And it matters because if you have an expression then, which then you evaluate, it will be just faster to evaluate, just take that one expression, evaluate it, and you know, make it square, than evaluate the left branch, evaluate the right branch, they are exactly the same thing, and then, then multiply them together. So if you look at this example here, the, the, this line over here that we, we took from expression to expression, and we have this case about multiply, if xp1 and xp2 are equal, and we want to have a square of xp1, this is just fine. However, this will not compile because the compiler would require you to actually provide uh, implementation for other cases as well, which do nothing. Though those implementations, they basically just pass around the value and nothing else, right? So there's a lot of boilerplate at this point. The, mo the important part, the important bit is the first line, but the other stuff is just passing around the re recursion explicitly. Is that an issue? Well, depending on how big of your structure is and its definition, and, and how you're cool with having all those bullet plates in your code base. But that's still not the case. Imagine that, for example, in this example, I will forget to call explicitly optimize on one of my expressions. Will this compile? Yes. It will compile because multiply expects on the left-hand side expression. The comp compiler will be, you know, happy. But we will get the wrong result. More importantly, if I call optimize on my leaves, if I call recursive call on my leaves as well, will this compile? Yes. Will it terminate? No. So that's the kind of issue here. That rec recursion, recursion in our code base, even if you do stuff in Haskell, you're kind of doomed with those things as well. And if we really look at this example, all our code base is doing is basically traversing our structure until it reaches the leaves. It picks up the values from those leaves and goes back um, towards the root of the structure and then calls the business logic, whatever that is, in our, in our function and gives us the final result. Wouldn't that be, you know, if, if you look at the make string, it will just do exactly the same thing. Optimize as well. It was to traverse the structure to the very end and go back and give you a value. Now, wouldn't that be nice if we had something that would actually traverse some mechanism that would traverse the structure for us? Would be just, if I just want to, if I'm evaluating, I want to I wanna say what it means to multiply two doubles together to give me a double, right? I don't want to go, there. I don't want to do the explicit recursion. Let somebody else do that mechanism for me. 
So this, if this, this evaluate function, I would rather have to not call recursively whatsoever. I would like to say multiply has a double one, and the first double and second double, and I would say what it means to actually multiply two doubles together. And I would like to pass that function as an argument to my mechanism that would traverse my structure for me, go to the leaves, pick up the values, go back and call my evaluate function with, with the doubles already. All right? But does it make sense? Or, or are you already tweeting? The idea is to have a function that just basically does the business logic and allow mechanism to traverse the structure for you and you are not really touching recursion whatsoever. But the problem is it's not really easy to implement this function uh, that way because expression, like multiply, holds other expression. It doesn't hold. So the multiply has xp1 and xp2, and those two are of type expression. They are not ty of type double, or in this example, they are not of type string. So in order to write this function that I could use with this mechanic mechanism, I was saying it, that will implicitly do the recursion for me, I have to change the definition of expression. So I, I don't want to no longer have this definition where, where basically, let's say, multiplication is, has XP, xp1, xp2. I want to have this definition polymorphic. So I want to say expression is polymorphic over some type A, and multiplication has xp1 of type A and xp2 of, of type A as well, whatever that A is. It might be a string, it might be a double, it might be a user, it might be whatever type that you actually provide. So this will allow us to actually write that function evaluate that, could, that will be working on expressions which are parameterized by double, not by anything else. But um, we kind of introduced this, uh, we made this a little bit more generic, but in a way we still need to, we, we, we provided this structure at the very beginning to represent expressions, right, which are recursive in their nature. So I, wanna, I still want to represent this, the old expression. I still want to represent it. The question is, with my new definition, can I actually do it? Is it possible? What I, what I should put in my A here to have this? Any thoughts? I could put an expression. Well, we can, we can actually check this out. So listen, um, integer value actually ignores the A, right? Integer value is, is parameterized by A, but just basically ignores it. It can be, you can put there string or user or double or whatever. So what we could do is we could just put unit. Unit as, as nothing, right? Uh, and, and that's fine. Now the question would be, what, what should I put here? in sum. Well, check this out. If, if those guys are expression of unit, so this guy is an expression of unit, and that guy is expression of unit as well, then the sum has to be parameterized by expression of unit. Because whatever those guys, whatever that A is, and that A here was expression of unit, so whatever that A is, it's actually that A. So that's expression of unit. So then my overall type, my sum type, will be expression of expression of unit. And it's uh, kind of weird, but it compiles. So, so we can actually still build this expression, the simple expression when I add two integers together, 10 plus 5. We can still represent this in this more generic representation. Because I can provide my expression as, a, as an A. Now the question is, OK, so what, but what if I have more, a little bit more, more complicated example? like this one. And we can, we can recreate the same reasoning, so I can still put that unit over here, so my sum is expression of unit, then those two guys have to be the same, so this has to be an expression of unit, so divide is expression of expression of unit, so my final expression is expression of expression of expression of unit. Which is, <laughs> but it's doable, it compiles, you can kind of if you've been living with Java world long enough, you kind of deal with boilerplate easily. So you can learn, teach yourself to just ignore the, the stuff. But the problem is that those things will compile. However, if you have 
if you have some function that is giving you uh, expression for some input. So let's say the input is a string, and our function is a parsing function that parses a string and supposed to give us the expression. In our previous representation, this would compile easily. However, here, we don't really know what kind of depth of our expression, final expression, will be. So what's the type here? It's, it's a recursion on the type level. It's like expression of expression of expression, and you don't really know, right? It won't compile. You kind of screwed at this point. So in order to fix this problem, we have to introduce something which is called fixed point data type. And there are different kind of fixed point data types. We will focus on one which is called fix. Now, fix. Um, professional speakers will tell you that somewhere in the middle of the presentation, and we are reaching the middle of the presentation, you're supposed to say a joke, right? Uh, Venkan Subramanian is always telling, like, in the middle jokes about his wife. I'm kind of scared about telling jokes about my wife, especially if the thing is being recorded. Um, so I give you a, a picture of a kitty, so your brain can relax, because you're going to see a fix in a minute. That's kind of a scary concept, especially if you don't do Java for a living. Um, but I still think it's easy, a nicer way to define fix in Scala than in Haskell. But don't worry, fix isn't really that bad. It's just, you just have to brace yourself, you know? Brace yourself, fix is coming. That, that would be a good man here, right? Uh, anyway, so this is fix. Fix is basically a wrapper for a value. This is a class that has a constructor that takes something. It just basically wraps something, this, this thing we called here unfix. So we might ask ourselves, what's the type of that thing? Well, we will also learn that fix is parametized by some type f. But it's not any f. You cannot put there string or user. It has to be a type which is itself polymorphic. So spoiler alert in our example that f here is our expression. So we are saying, listen, fix is parameterized by that f, and we, are, we will be wrapping, we will be taking something of some type, and we will be wrapping that over our fix. And what's the type of that something? Well, that something has to be of type f, but that f is parameterized by which? And we are saying, by fix of f. If that kind of blows your mind, deal with it. Uh, just, you know, give yourself some time. It will eventually compile in your head. Uh, just kind of believe me that it does, all right? I just want to show you, because we only have 45 minutes, and it's already 30 minutes so far, and there are other cool stuff I want to show you. So just, just, just bear with me, you know, it compiles. So it works. So let me give you an example. So we, we had this expression here, an expression of expression of a unit. So when I said that, fix will wrap our, uh, our f, and that f here is our expression. Let's just do that, and let's see what value will we actually get from using this. So let's first wrap our leaves, our integer values. So we are wrapping them over fix. So now the question would be, what should be the type of that int value? It shouldn't be no longer unit. So let's check our definition. Since Things, it, fix is already wrapping over expression, right? So the f is expression. So the f should be parametized by fix of expression, right? If, if I'm wrapping my expression over fix, then the, then, sorry, have to jump here. Ugh. Then this thing requires us to our f, so our expression, be parameterized by a fix of expression. It's just by definition here. If you want to wrap me with, if you want to wrap a value which is expression, I'm all good, but that expression has to be parameterized by fix of expression. That, that's the only way for this to compile. And then we can wrap yet our sum, and it's going to be a fix of expression as well, and we can wrap our final element as well as fix, and the type of it is a fix of expression. So we are breaking this chain of fix over fix over fix over something, because on the type level, we have this ability to, to kind of break that. All, so let, let me show you the more, more, this, this second example, which, it's, which is a little bit more complex. But we are doing exactly the same thing. We'll be wrapping 
our expressions with fix. So we're wrapping our, our leaves so they are fixed and they are parameterized by fix of expression. And so we will do the same thing with our decimal value and then with sum and then with our final division. So our final typo is the fix of expression. Check this out. This is the original structure that we have. Oh, sorry, and the Scala is not really that great, but sometimes it will do type interference. So this is actually where it helps. So this will compile as well. I mean, it's, this thing is still needed, but compiler will handle this. So, so the kind of look final, final structure like this, looks like this. So that's a cool stuff. I mean, there's a little bit of boilerplate here still, but it's not really that bad, right? We are able to represent our recursive structure with our, with our types here. The only thing is that we have to wrap every element in that structure with fix. And this compiles. And the cool thing is, is now that when you have that function, the last one that, that we didn't really know what kind of level of recursive calls we're going to have in our structure, you can just say, this is type of fix expression. Now, somebody might ask right now, OK, this is fine, but we don't really want to work with fix of expression. We need an expression. It's a question for you guys. How do I get expression from fix of expression? I call unfix. Yeah, I call unfix, and it works. Exactly. So just a reminder here. So we kind of, what we did right now is what government's been doing for decades. So basically, we introduced a problem, and then we found a solution for it. Um, but just a reminder here, we did that, we had a purpose at the very beginning. The idea was to represent this evaluate function or whatever function in a way that we will be able to say evaluate works on expression of doubles and gives us a double. So we will no longer have recursive calls within our function that will be provided. Somebody else will do the recursion implicitly for us and we just provide the business logic. So we're almost done. Um, we have a fix. We can represent our structure. And we need this mechanism, which is called catamorphism. And if you think catamorphism has some fancy connection to math, it really isn't. It's just Eric Myers probably you know, having fun with their friends, having beer, and just thought of different nice. Catamorphism is basically fold, fold R. And in the paper, they are telling you. So basically, they first introduced you to the catamorphism. And once your head is you know, overwhelmed with all the category theory, they were just going to be like, oh, it's actually fault R if you're using functional programming. I'm like, holy shit, well, thank you. You're telling me that right now. Uh, that would actually be a good metaphor from the very beginning. But if you need to build some mental model here, catamorphism is nothing else than fault R, just defined very generic for any data structure that you have. So, so if, for example, if you have lists, in that paper they start with lists as an example. Lists are cool because you already know how the structure looks like. You have nil, you have cons, you're fine, you can do fold R. Even if you don't have a function fold R, you can implement fold R on your own. The question would be, how can I fold, how can I call catamorphism on whatever structure that I, that I have? And the idea here in recursion schemes is that if you provide function, functor for your structure, you should be fine. So now the question is, who doesn't know what a functor is at this conference? OK. Um, um, in four minutes, one on one, OK? Uh, <laughs> all right. So, functor, uh, the thing of a functor, and especially implemented in Scala, so in funct functor is a type class. Um, the idea behind type class is that you provide additional set of features to, within your type. So you're saying you're giving your type this ability. Listen, you can be a member of my, on my, of my club. You can, you type, you, you can be a member of my club as long as you implement this set of features and they will obey this set of laws. And if you do that, we good. All right? So the idea here with functor is that if any other type f wants to be a member of a functor type class, uh, he or she has to implement one single method, which is called map. And the idea is that if I have some f of a, 
and I have a function that comes from A to B, this map will give me F of B. In our example, if I have an expression of, let's say, integer, and I have a function from integer to string, this will give me expression of string. Does that make sense? And uh, so, so in Scala, so in Scala, uh, type classes aren't uh, con level; on a, they are not defined on the type, on the level language, on language level. Sorry, on language level, they kind of build uh, as a thing using some other concept from the language. Uh, the idea is well, pretty much simple. I'll just have to skip through some of the slides here. Um, but if I if I'm saying I have some function, f um, let's say I have some function foo that takes some a. Uh, it's, it's parameterized some, by some uh, a and some t, and I might have my a of t, and I have some function from t to integer, and I want to have this a of integer. I cannot really implement this. I don't have enough knowledge about what a is and what t is to implement that. However, if I say there is an instance of a functor for my type, type a, then I already know enough, because now I can call that map function and this will just work. And the way you provide the, the, the instance is you just basically, in, at least in Scala, you provide instance of that, of that trait. If you're from Java world, trait, interface, basically the same thing. You just provide that, that, that uh, instance of that trait and it kind of works. So, as I said, only four minutes. Uh, we did that in two. Uh, whoever is lost, sorry. Um, but this may be, it will be kind of easier to understand. This is our expression, and now we need to pr we, need, we want to make expression the member of the functor fun club, right? We need to have an instance of a functor for our expression. So, as I said, we need to pro provide implementation to that trait functor, which means we need to provide an implementation to method map, which which will take two arguments. It will take the expression of A, and it also will take a function that goes from A to B. So the, so the implementation is kind of straightforward, and if you, if you look at it, it kind of resembles the, the, all the recursive functions that we have, right? If, if I have a leaf, I will just return that leaf. If, if I have some other structure within it, I will call F on it. So once we provide an instance of a func for a functor for our type, in this example for the expression, the catamorphism, the mechanism that will traverse our structure, will actually do the recursive calls for us, can work on any type, as long as that type has, a, has an instance of a functor. Um, so that's one thing we have, awesome. Last bit, finally, is that function, that, that, that function that we were hoping to implement like a half an hour ago. Um, one info before we do it. It's not, it actually has a name. The name of this function, it's, it's something that they call f-algebra. And um, it's not really the algebra that Adam Varsky was telling you about. F-algebras are functions. There's nothing to it. It's basically uh, al uh, algebra of fa is just a function fa to a. So like expression of double to double. Okay? Is it? So as I was saying, I'm not an expert. Um, you guys know this joke about this old mathematical professor? He was like 70 or something, and he was doing those different talks in different universities and states, and he was so tired of it, and he was always driving with his driver, and like one day they're driving from one university to another, and the driver sees this math professor is like really, really exhausted, so he's telling like, listen boys, I've seen your talk like 100 times, I, can, I don't understand it, but I can basically do it from the memory. You know, you just sit back and I will do it for you. So that's what they did. And the driver is actually in the middle of the, of the presentation and some student in the middle of the seat is like asking a very, very hard question. Excuse me, I have a question. So the driver is like, oh, this, this question is so trivial. I will ask somebody from the end of the hall to answer it. 
So the algebras are so trivial, I will just you know, let Adam answer it. Um, but anyway, we need to provide this. And, and that's basically what we're doing here. So evaluate is now algebra, which is a function from expression of double to double. So kind of is neat right now, right? We, have, we only deal with doubles at this point, and we are only at this point doing the business logic here. So, uh, and, and the same, same thing goes for our make string as well. So that's, in, that's an example. So I have this algebra to evaluate that doesn't do the recursion, because the recursion will be done for me. I'm just concentrating on the business logic here. And now I have some expression, which I can define with fixed point data types, as you guys remember. And now, at the very end, I have this mechanism that is called catamorphism that is implemented in, fortunately, in Matroshka. So that function kata you get from Matroshka, at least in, in Scala, and, 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 and that's it, and it works. It gives you the, it gives you, the, it evaluates you the expression that is defined here with a function evaluate. All you have to provide is that f algebra. So if I have my make string function and I have example one more time and I call expression to kata make string function, it will give me the representation of that expression in string. It's kind of like with go to. When Dijkstra made this two page paper about go to being harmful, he never said we should remove go to. He just said go to is kind of a problem as an like explicit element of the language and in the high level languages, and it should be put, pushed to the lower level languages so the, rec uh, so the go to is done implicitly for us. We never use go to, right? We have for loops, while loops, or whatever. We kind of think of the more, more abstract concepts. But if you look underneath your assembly language, whatever that is, bytecode or whatever, go to is still there. And the idea here is about recursion schemes as something similar, but for recursions. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. And we have 12 minutes to actually show you the rest, rest a little bit more of the icebergs. Are you guys interested or, or, or Twitter? We good? All right, awesome. Great. Um, so you remember this example of Optimize, where I had this bunch of boilerplate, and also I could pro provide a lot of errors because I could call optimize on my leaves, or I could, I could forget the optimize, and this thing would either not terminate or would not work correctly for some of the, some of the input. Uh, if I define optimize in terms of algebra, where I'm saying this is basically a function from express expression to a fix of expression, this kind of shortened to, to this definition where I only have my, my real concern, which is the case where we have a multiplication of two elements and those elements are equal, then we just optimize it to square, and the other rest is just keep the rest, and that's it. And it optimize here works, just believe me, it works. Now, catamorphism is easy to understand because basically it's fold R. If you've been working with lists for for sometimes the, the chances that you've seen fold R is big. Um, but there are, there are other morphism, morphisms that were defined in the original paper, but they are all, were also extended throughout the years. Um, we're not going to go through all of them because that would be like more additional talks, and I only know a few, not all. Um, but I want to show you something cool. Um, there's another morphism uh, which is called anamorphism. And anamorphism, is basically unfold. Um, and unfold, the idea is about, about, about unfold is that when fold takes your structure and gives you a value, then unfold is something, it, it's, a, it's a dual of, of, that, of that thing. So it takes a value and gives you an expression. So if, for example, I have some integer and I want to see an expression that defines that integer in terms of multiplication two multiplied by two by two by two by some odd number here. So if I want to have something like that, anamorphism is the, the thing that I'm looking for. So you need to provide a, a, a dual full algebra, which is surprisingly called co-algebra, and that's basically the reverse function from value A, let's say from double, 
to an expression, so in this example, to expressions of double. So I can, I can define my divisors function as a cold algebra saying if n is, uh, can be divided by 2 and is not 2, then we're just returning multiply 2 and n divided by 2. In other examples, just, just give the, the leaf value. And if I call, if I take some value, let's say 12, and call this uh, anamorphism with that call algebra, this will give me the, the, the expression. So this is one of the examples. And now, bear with me. I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make a point here. Just, it will take like five minutes. So this is one of the expressions you might wonder why, when I might need it. That depends on your context. But uh, there's another expression called hylomorphism. And you might be already like, holy crap, the next one. Where's my tweeter, right? But don't worry, it's not really that hard. Holomorphism is nothing else than just basically uh, anamorphism followed by catamorphism. So let's say you have a value and you want to calculate the factorial for it. Uh, a very dumb implementation, but kind of proves my point, would be taking that value, doing an anamorphism which would give us the um, expression representing that value, and then calling catamorphism that will call this, take the evaluate function that will actually evaluate it, right? So that, see, the anamorphism will explode the value to a structure, and then that structure will be evaluated to, to a factorial, right? So 12 will, be, 12 will be represented as, as 2 times 2 times 2 times 3, and then we will evaluate it to whatever is factorial of 12, something big. Um, now, so why, as I said, uh, hylomorphism is exactly that, and you might wonder why should I care. The cool thing is, if you really think about it, how, how it works, how the, how, the catamorphism, how the anamorphism works, it takes a value, decomposes it into structure, it has now some structure and a value, so it takes that value and deconstruct it, so it goes down the tree until it, it reaches a leaf. So it's already one passing of that structure. Catamorphism, on the other hand, the next step, will have to traverse that structure first to your leaves, and then will go back to give you a value. Now, so you have, we have two passings of that structure. We first create it, and then we traverse it back to actually calculate a value. Hylomorphism will do that for us. So while anamorphism is actually creating that structure, the catamorphism will be already traversing it in parallel. So when this is done, it will only just have to go back and gives us the value. So it is almost twice as fast because it's just running those two guys instead of running the first one and then the second one. Those guys are running in parallel and give you the final result. And, and here is an example of, of, of using a high-low uh, but I hope you guys get, kind of get the idea. Now, as I said, there are more cool things about recursion schemes. And the cool thing about recursion schemes is whatever that is cool about functional programming is that they are composable. And this feature of composability gives you a lot of strength and a lot of robustness that you can have in your code base, especially if you're doing a lot of recursions in your code base. Because the stuff that I show you so far was basically giving you an ability to kind of free yourself from recursion and from all the problems of recursion because recursion, scheme, the recursion is done for you implicitly. But think of, a, think of an example of an example that I can give from the context of my company as, a, as a writing a compiler, if you ever have to. But there are other problems which would be similar. But this one is kind of, kind of trivial to explain. If you have, for example, a compiler for, for Scala, codebase, or Haskell, what, you know, and, and in Scala, you have for comprehension or, or do notation in Haskell, which in Scala, for comprehension is on the compiler time level, the sugared to calls of flat map, flat map, flat map, and map. So if you, and this is how exactly how Scala compiler is actually implemented, it's implemented in phases. It's something which is called multipassing. So the idea is that you take your code base, your, your AST, and the, in first step, let's say, you just traverse the whole structure of your code base, and you find all the four comprehensions, and you, and you de-sugar them 
to calls of flat maps, flat maps, flat maps, and, and map at the very end. To all the Haskell developers, flat map bind, the same idea. And then once you have that, so you came from AST to AST, now you have a new AST, new representation of your code base, and now you can do some other stuff. So do some other the sugaring or some other the compilation until on the final, final step you, uh, you compile to your final assembly, whatever that is. And, and Scala is going to be bytecode. And this idea is pretty neat because now you have those little functions on which you can focus on. I can I basically have this function that takes a code base and gives me the sugared version without four comprehensions. I can unit test it. I can, I can just focus on that simple idea. And if that works, I can combine with all those other functions that I have here, combine them together, and I have very maintainable code base. The problem is this code base is really, really slow. Right? But I, because I have to traverse that structure each time I'm calling this function. So while multipassing is nice in terms of uh, maintainability, uh, most of the other languages are using something which is called um, monolith. And, and it's not a monolith from microservices, it's other monolith. And um, the idea is that you just take the code base and you have a function that gives you the assembly. Every the sugaring, everything is just one, the, done in this one thing here. Uh, which is, from the uh, performance point of view, a, a neat idea. However, from maintainability, it's kind of hell. Now, you can think of those functions as catamorphisms. Anamorphisms as well, but I don't want to confuse you. So I, that function that goes from for comprehension that, that compiles that to the, um, to the flat map, that actually is a catamorphism. It takes an expression and the value, uh, sorry, it takes the AST and the value is still AST. So now we could define those one more time, kind of do this multipassing, right? So we can define those little steps. So here I'm the sugaring this and here I'm the sugaring that. And we can define that all as F algebras. So we have this maintainability feature and testability and all that. But the but as I said, recursion schemes are composable. So the, the final function that you're going to get is just a, is, is just a F algebra composed with F algebra composed with F algebra. So the final thing that you run over your structure goes over that structure once. Do you get the kind of thing that we have here? We can focus, when we define those little things, we can focus only on the things that we are interested in like the sugaring this or the sugaring that. But on our production call, when we actually you know, call and we, we take a source code and we want to have assembly here, we will have a single run, which is something which is called nanopassing. And all those kind of cool features that, and neat features that you would normally get when you do functional programming because you have composability in your code base, think of all, about all that that you normally get from your type system, think that you can have it for recursions as well. And this is actually a very cool idea if you guys are interested, um, Matroshka, uh, sorry, um, Quasar, uh, we have something. We, we basically compi uh, we compile them from SQL to a uh, logical plan, which represents SQL, which later on we compile down to some NoSQL databases, to some, some dedicated connectors to physical plan. And if you want to see that in action, if you want to see recursion schemes that will blow your mind, I am just uh, encourage you guys to see um, Quasar. Uh, references some different papers that I read to actually make this talk and to actually understand what I'm doing at work, if you're interested. My name is Pavel Schultz. Uh, this is my Twitter if you want to complain, email as well, and uh, my blog. And I have two or three minutes to take questions if anyone is interested. That, well, thank you. Uh, thanks, very cool talk. And uh, I have a question. You certainly should have a problem with tail recursion because, for example, when you created this yeah. data structure with fixed points, I saw at least like there was some branching out. Yeah, yeah. Do you like trump align them no. or like what? You trump align them. So, no, 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 no. So the thing is, Matroshka is, uh, is implemented as, uh, as a port from uh, Kemet implementation. And in Haskell, you don't have problems with tail recursion, right? Yes. Yes. And uh, Matroshka is also. Um, business-driven open source library. So we have features that we need in our product. And we, so far, we have Quasar running in different environments, like very 
I would say, complex environments, and we still didn't hit the problem of tail recursion. So right now, this is not, there's no trampolines in it. Probably there's going to be if we're going to have an issue on a GitHub like, Jesus Christ, this thing isn't working. We have stack, stack overflow exceptions. Uh, but so far, we, we, it's not implemented with, with, with trampolines. Thanks. Uh, so I think you can also use free Monad to do the exact same thing. And also, you get monadic syntax for free. So uh, what's the advantage of using fixed data type over that? Uh, so I, did I have free here uh, in this example? No. I mean, you, in, in Quasar, meaning in Quasar. No, uh, I, mean, I mean, you can implement the same thing as free monad. Mm, what do you mean? Free, uh, free monad is one of the recursion schemes. So yes. you, you, if, you've seen, uh, if you've seen Adam's talk, um, all right. Uh, so free mona is basically you have a pure, which is like, like the leaf, and you also have uh, the free. Which yeah, is so you can, you can think of a free of um, SA being defined as basically um, either. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, 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 get it. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, so basically, you can, you can think of a, so if you define in Scala, you can think of a free as basically being two things. So it's, uh, so it's either, so it's either um, an SFA, yes. right? Or, uh, or it's A, correct? That's free. And co-free, while you add it, is, is uh, Something similar. Sorry, co-free. Uh, it's gonna be. It's gonna be a. Um, life coding sucks. Um, it's gonna be a pair of SI and I. Uh, sorry, I'm not. Uh, very, I'm not a Scala programmer, but my. Okay, so the idea is. So, so, so the, the or here is this either type. If you, no, if you, no, no, no. So in so, so this is this those those are two types that you can treat. So we've been using fix as a fixed point data type that allows us to represent a recursive structure with a type that wasn't recursive, by definition, right? Because expression yes. wasn't recursive, so and we used and we used fix to kind of go back to recursive structure. So so in, in Haskell at least, so free is defined as either you get a pure value. Yeah. The other one is a functor over free itself. That's exactly what that is here. That's more, more, even more simplified version of it. No, it's a functor over free itself. It's recursive. So the free, free monad is you either get a leaf or you get a tree, like which is like a functor over the free. Yes. So by doing that, but you it's can still a type. It. It's still a type. It's still a type that you can use to represent a recursive structure. You can do that with free, and it gives you a, an, a, an ability to, because with, with co-free, you're no longer saying, I have an expression with, so it, with co-free, you can just label your elements of your recursive structure. So for example, in expression, you might say, first level, second level, and that, that A is gonna be your string or what integer. In free, you are saying it's either that recursive thing or some A or some yes. string. Yes. But it's so, still it's still define a type that defines a recursive structure. Yes. And recursion schemes give you the mechanism to traverse that structure. Sure. Uh, my question my original question was that that kind of type also gives you a monadic syntax because it has a leaf. So you can implement your expression as a wrapper of free monad and then you can uh, write your DST Okay. Uh, that's monad monadic syntax. So you don't have to use fix, which you, you don't have, have to wrap to and unwrap yourself. You don't have to use fix, you can. So I was just wondering if you've... So you're going to use... This. So for example, let's say an expression in our example. Uh, you remember expression, which were... Just to give you... Um, before there were some other questions, and we, we were probably just going to jump to... And I can, I can talk about it in a second if you want. But that expression, I don't know if I have it somewhere here still. Oh, crap. That ex oh, there it is. That expression had some leaves, like, like integer value and decimal value, and then, and then some recursive structures, right, in a, in a way. Let's say expression only doesn't have those leaves. 
There is no int value and there is no decimal value. Right? Let's imagine that int, int value and decimal value are defined as some types, but not in your ADT here. Let's say that ADT comes from some library and you have some other types that represent the leaves. Then you will not use fix. Then you will use free because you're going to have free of expression and let's say integer value. Because now you have a fix, a free represents your fixed point data type and you're saying I have either my structure, so my expression, or some leaf integer. And then that's when you, because free is recursive in its nature, it's basically fixed point data type, right? But you still need that mechanism that will traverse that data type and that, that's what recursion schemes gives you. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much.